Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV in association with OA, uh, organized by Varanasi Orthopedic Association. To introduce today's topic and speaker, I hand over to our moderator, Dr. Ashutosh Agarwal. Hello, good evening, everybody. Now we are here for UP Orthopedic webinar with uh, uh, VOA. Uh, now I request Dr. Ashish Kumar sir, is the president elect UPOA, to say a few words. <coughs> sir, you are muted. Ab, aa gaya? Yes, sir, aa gaya, sir. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Ashish. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be in the arthroscopy meet of this Friday. And your untiring effort of uh, every time conducting it and uh, collecting everybody and uh, asking personally. And uh, it's, uh, I must congratulate the Varanasi Orthopedic Club for doing a wonderful job. And uh, I welcome all the speakers and uh, chairperson. So just please go ahead. Don't waste time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, today we are here for uh, shoulder. We have got three topics yep. and we have got three speakers for this Dr. Apin Nair and Dr. Sundi Datta from Calcutta and Dr. Amit Kumar Jha from Varanasi. And we have three panelists, Dr. Arun Gupta from Agra, Dr. Arjun Saru from Meerut and Dr. Arvind P. Gupta from Patna. Also, the first speaker is Dr. Arun Nair to speak on clinical evaluation of shoulder joint. Uh, Dr. Epin Nair is a consultant shoulder sports trauma at Manipal Hospital at Whitefield and Jandagar. He is a fellow in shoulder <laughs> surgery. So kindly mute all of you. I request all of you to kindly mute. Dr. Epin is a fellow in shoulder surgery from Japan, South Korea and Australia. He is also done his fellowship in the Robotic Joint Replacement Surgery, Steiger Institute, USA. I request Dr. Appen to start the presentation. And I request all the speakers to stick on time. Good evening to you all. Good evening, sir. Great pleasure. And I thank you. Dr. Appen, can you unmute yourself? Dr. Appen? Dr. Appen, what, what? Yeah, am I you. audible? Am I audible? Yes. You're audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. So I was saying, sir, uh, good evening to you all. And uh, um, a special thanks to Ashutosh, sir, and uh, the entire UPOA and Varanasi Orthopedic Association as well. Uh, especially, sir, because you have put in a lot of effort to you know, contact, even you have spoken to me so much, so much minute uh, you know, um, details you go into. Really, thank you so much. So I will, um, my topic is uh, shoulder examination. Uh, so I have like, a, how long is my time, sir? 10 minutes? Or... You got 15 minutes. 15 oh. minutes. Okay, My slide is visible, sir. Yes, it is visible. So there is some background, uh, some uh, some sound is there. I think I'll go ahead, but yeah. Please uh, carry on. Good evening, uh, good evening to all. I work at Manipal Hospitals, Whitefield, uh, Bangalore, and uh, today I'll be speaking on the shoulder examination. So the shoulder is a very complex joint. We have multiple small joints inside in the shoulder, like the AC joint, sternoclavicular joint, the subacromial space, glenohumeral joint as well as uh, the scapula. So we have, so clinical examination would involve each and every step. So examining even the, even the smaller. Okay. So here uh, coming to the shoulder uh, examination, starting off with the inspection. In the inspection, so like inspection, palpation and ROM and the special tests. So coming to inspection, I always start examination from the front. So we have I start with the cervical the spine and, then you start with the cervical and uh, spine, I examine and the, the patient by completely spine, stripping till the, the waist. Back, 
I will check the inspection and the palpation. The inspection will work. So I will start the examination with the uh, palpation and the inspection, the palpation of the cervical spine. I do the always clear out the cervical spine by inspecting, palpating, seeing for, seeing for any deformities, and uh, then looking for the ROM for the cervical spine. So uh, the extension, flexion, lateral rotations. So all the movements, these movements restricted will give us a fair idea about cervical spine involvement because always there is uh, sometimes uh, there could be the decent disease, nerve compressions, which can mimic shoulder problems. Then I start my inspection from the front. So I always start with the sternoclavicular joint, the clavicle, I see the AC joint, the AC joint, and then uh, coming to the deltoid and come, coming posteriorly. So normally, if there is any malunions, non-unions, you can always pick up. We can see sternoclavicular dislocations. Coming to the AC joint, we can also see any deformities in the AC joint or broadening of the clavicle can also be seen. Then we come down, again, we see the coracoid and subcoracoid area, the biceps area, the deltoid, seeing for any deltoid wastings, and then coming posteriorly. Posterior also is very important because here we have the main muscles, the levator scapulae, the trapezius. We can see that, so if there is any tautness of the muscles, and we also see the suprascapular fossa, supraspinatus fossa, and the infraspinatus fossa. See for any wastings there, and also see for any obvious winging of the scapula. So coming to palpation, I repeat this. I repeat the same process in the palpation. I again started the sternoclavicular joint. Look for any tenderness. Palpate along the clavicle, the AC joint. Here we can actually feel see for any AC joint arthritic conditions like tenderness or even like prominence of the bone there. Then I just immediately come below and palpate for the coracoid process. That's a coracoid process there. And sometimes we can, in some cases, for example, a pectoralis minor tightness with protraction of scapula, we can feel that there is there could be some tenderness in the P minor insertion. And we, in case of subcoracoid bursitis, also we can have um, uh, tenderness there. So uh, then we come on to the the biceps. So biceps, we palpate the long head of the biceps. So we can there I'm uh, seeing the you know seeing uh, this is how a protracted scapula would be, and you know, that's what happens when you have P minor tightness. And I'm, I, that is a biceps uh, I'm palpating for any longer bicep that is biceps tendinitis, uh, tenosynovitis, any collection under biceps we can always feel that, and in especially near the anterior axillary fold that is where it the biceps passes down. So a rotation of the joint definitely gives us a better appreciation of the bicep. Then I palpate around the subcoracoid area, the feeling for any bursite is going to take up, pick up inflammation. And the you can see that that is a levator scapulae, the trapezius, so coming in there, and also in the scapula. I mean the movements. So the normal ROM would be a forward flexion. So we need complete 180 degrees forward flexion. And uh, coming to that is abduction, abduction in the scapular plane. We have around uh, 45 degrees of extension. External rotation, this variable could go up to 80 degrees in some patients. Some 45 to 80 degrees would be. But always a comparison with the opposite side is always great. So now rotations are done in three planes. That is with the hand adducted at zero degrees of abduction. And then at 90 degrees of abduction and 90 degrees of forward flexion. So always we have to compare with the opposite side, see if there is any pain during the arc. That's again internal rotation with the hand adducted, that is at the zero. Normally we can take it up to D7. If there is a restriction, it comes down. 
So coming to the next part, which is the scapula. The scapula uh, is very really important. Has, on the left side, you can see the middle compared to this is a slight shortness of the trapezius as well as the levator scapula. The shorter the slightly raised on the reciprocal side because of the spasm. So this particular patient has levator scapula overactivity, but the levator scapula is very really taut along with trapezius. Normally, when the scapula moves with abduction up and down, the scapula should be symmetrically going on both sides. None of the sides of the scapula should be um, abnormally visible. So we'll ask him to take it from the side up. These are the different ways to do scapular design. What he notices is taking the hand up and slowly bring it down, please. Here we can so see the prominence now of the superior so part of the scapula. You can see this particular point down. Stop, please. Yeah. The upper superior superior part of the scapula is prominent. So this falls in the category of type 3 scapular dyskinesis. You can see the very taut muscle. You can see the trapezius and the levator scapula here. And going all the way up, it is severely taut. The trapezius is also taut. Bring it down slowly, please. So you can see it going. Yeah. Bring it down slowly. 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 This again, stop. At 90 degrees, with the hand internally rotated like this, you can, this again brings out a dyskinesis. This is the second way to check for this is the second test for scapular dyskinesis. This also brings out some kind of dyskinesia. And this is the third position to check for dyskinesis. And now we're looking for the wing of the scapula. This is this is not a classic, it's not a neurological wing, but again, it is dyskinesia. Okay, so this is the third position to check for dyskinesis. Okay, so this is the third position to check for dyskinesis. And you can see that it is basically this he's got abnormal uh, muscular imbalance there. Now coming to special tests. So we have finished the regular examination, coming to special tests, but the now for the rotator cuff. Rotator cuff. Oh, so here yeah, the shoulder goes into abduction. So we start with the full can test, the empty can test. So I'm, I'll be just describing the full can and the empty can. So this is the full can test. Of the scapular plane of 90 degrees. Slowly. Yeah. Take a thumbs up. Thumbs up. Very good. Now, pressure against resistance. And there's full power. If there is a power loss or pain, it is positive. Yeah. There is out, please. Yeah. So coming to the empty can. Take it up and reverse. Push it up, please. And this is a drop arm tips. Suppose it is you, the patient has got a, a massive rotator cuff tear, and the, the, there could be a pseudo parallel, or even a drop arm could be positive. So this is a drop arm test. Yeah. This is a drop arm test. Ask the patient to take the hand up. So if I passively take the hand up it, and ask him to down, drop it down slowly. slowly. So here, this is negative because the patient is able to hold the abduction drop arm. There's no drop arm here. But when it suddenly drops arm, drops down, it's called as a positive drop arm. In some patient, it doesn't drop. So we have to tap the hand. When it comes down, you tap it, and suddenly it will drop. Next is for coming to the subscapularis. For it is mainly for the subscapularis, but I've given here the differentials. What other things could be positive? What are the other differentials in such patients? So, so this is how we do an internal rotation lag. So ask the patient to lift off. That means keep it there and lift it off. When he's pushing it off, it's called a lift off test. And when he's taking it up and not being able to bring it down. So I'll repeat. So he's taking it up, pushing the hand off, but he's not able to sustain that. Uh, you know, lift, it is called as a lag sign. The bear hug test. Take the arm into 90 degree. Take the arm into 90 degree. Abduction. Put your abduction. And then apply. So I, I think there's some problem in the slide. I'll just play it again. Take the arm into 90 degree. Abduction. Yeah. Elbow bend. And then I'm sorry, but I don't think the video is visible. Apply. But it basically, you hold the hand into the opposite shoulder. Try to hold it there, and we try to pull it off. And if it is not, the patient is not able to sustain that hug. So we call it a positive bear hug again for the subscapularis mainly. Please, please, your hand into 90 degrees. Then ask the patient to press. I think there's some small hiccup with my video. And here is the the coming to the belly press. It's called as a Napoleon's belly press test. So here. The patient holds the hand. I wish I could show that. I'll try to play it again. Please press against the central adduction or an extension of the shoulder. Okay, the test is positive. 
So these are uh, coming to the infraspinal test test. The infraspinal test is the main external rotator, and we have to resist. Let us okay, ask the patient with the arm adducted, ask him to resist to to the outer side, the external rotation, and see for the power as well as check for pain. So it is in a torn infraspinal test. Okay, these are the findings. Okay, we could have uh, the external rotation would be limited. So coming to the horn blower, it is basically for a TV's minor pathology, and this is why we do a horn blower test. The shoulder is in abduction in the scapular plane of 90 degrees, and the arm is external rotated. And now the patient has to push against resistance externally. Push it. So this is the horn blower. Okay. Coming to the impingement test. So the impingement, there's a near test and a Hawken test. A hand will be full. Near test is, uh, so I think I have some problem with my video, somehow it's not happening. So here what happens in the near test is, okay, so hand is taken into, we can see how the examiner is holding the hand. The, he's Dr. Sumit who works with me. So now we have to internally rotate the hand. Which is in the Hello, sir. The, the hand is taken in the internal rotation and slowly we'll take it up passively forward. If there is any pain, okay, then you have a positive knee the test. Hand will be fully and I'll just uh, try to reboot my, um, my, start my PowerPoint again and see if you don't mind. Give me a moment, please. Uh, meanwhile, Ashutosh, uh, if there are any questions, yeah, yeah, the examination, like the chronological age-related diagnostic window, uh, when the patient walks into the to your office, how can you make out that what sort of pathology the patient may be according to his age? Yeah, I think I have a serious problem in the video. I'm so sorry. I'll have to explain it this way. So. Uh, the near test, okay, so I was just saying, it is called the impingement again, and uh, we there's a hand in this position. We have to uh, you have to completely internally rotate it and passively take it up. So if it's positive, okay, then if it is painful, it is a positive test. Uh -huh. Then coming to the Hawking-Kennedy test, that is, again, the hand is taken forward, forward and uh, taken into forward flexion 90 degrees and internally rotated. So again, um, if it is painful, again, the positive uh -huh. test. Painful arc. All of us have learned about the painful arc. So normally, if there is if there is pain developing between 60 to 120 degrees of abduction in the scapular plane, so that is when the bursa it comes in maximum compression, and that is where we have more of pain. So it's a positive impingement. At the same time, if the arc in the when we're doing an arc and the painful arc is at terminal abduction, then it is a mostly an AC joint pathology. Coming to specific test for the AC joint, this, so there are two tests normally I rely on. That is, we have painful arc, but pain is in the terminal abduction, or a cross arm adduction. That means you take in the hand to do opposite of the cross arm. So cross arm adduction test is also a positive test for um, um, AC joint, AC joint arthritis. But mainly, I would not at all depend upon the test. I would depend on the test definitely, but tenderness over the AC joint. And um, um, any deformity, any palpable bony, uh, bony irregularity there is a very is more specific. O'Brien test. Okay, for the superior label test is O'Brien test, and uh, the O'Brien test would um, it basically involves we have to take a hand into forward flexion, adduction that is forward flexion of 90 degrees. Take into 15 degrees of adduction, a, a deduction, and then uh, so. Ashutosh, sir, uh, can you, uh, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, audible. Yeah, you audible. I said, um, there is, I am trying to, um, one more laptop is okay, where the videos are working. Can you give me a 10 seconds? I'll just come on that. It is already, I have joined in, joined in by the Zoom. Can you give me a moment, please? I'll just yeah, come sure, on sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. Dr. Arun, 
your daughter hello daughter arun yeah uh, yeah yeah and daughter uh, arvind daughter arvind hello daughter kanda daughter kanda can we go for the next speaker in the meantime Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you are audible. Okay. Yes. So. Yeah, this is I was at the infrastructure test, the resistive tension rotation test. So here, this is how we do the resistive tension rotation. Test. The horn blower, okay, I was able to show, and the impingement signs. Here we can see that I was trying to explain that okay, we put the hand into internal rotation and passively take it up. And if there is pain, okay, then it is a positive test. And the Hawking Kennedy test. So here. The painful arc. So it's explaining like 60 to 100 degrees is the impingement and AC joint at the terminal uh, reproduction. AC joint is. This coming to superior label test. This is how we do the O'Brien test. Hello, Doctor Appen. You are not audible. Okay, sir. Hello, Doctor Appen. Can we do one thing? If we can complete your talk in the question answer session. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm almost done. Okay, okay yes, sir. sir. So uh, this is a another test called the crank test. And um, some two tests for the I'll just far go fast through this. The two tests we do for the bicep tendon. So this is the this is a speed test. Yeah. The hand is in complete ex hand is in complete extension. Uh -huh. ask, ask the patient to resist. Yeah. And next is the ear gas in test. Where we flex the elbow and again resist it and feel for the biceps. Coming to the main shoulder instability test. So these are. Uh, the most important test for the shoulder instability, especially the anterior instability. So we have this is the first part of the test involves taking the hand into abduction and uh, external rotation and pushing the shoulder out. That is an apprehension test. And from the front you push it back. That is a relocation. And suddenly if you release it, then the patient become apprehensive again. That is a release test. Then the sulcus sign. This is a sulcus sign. So where we pull the hand down. See for any sulcus in that area. 
the these are the next two tests are very important for posterior instability so posterior instability we have this jerk test so where what we do is take the hand forward rotate it forward and then you push it suddenly back see i'm taking it forward and we have to push it back that's a jerk test and the kim test is also described for posterior instability so here what we have to do is we have to give a we have to take the hand forward but also gives a give a slight inferior push on the humerus and push it up and it's for posterior inferior stable so if you take it up and push it back again a combination of the these two tests the jerk and the uh, jerk test and the kim test is very important for posterior instability there's another important test for posterior instability nowadays we find more and more posterior instability uh, coming especially with the uh, mdi so here we take the hand up like this we take it up 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 and give a posterior force this is the posterior apprehension test this is a load shift test is a test again for the glenohumeral instability and it's very simple to do we can see the stabilize the shoulder the, with the right hand the scapula and move it front and back when you are moving it front see the amount of translation more than 25% anterior translation is would be abnormal and a posterior translation with the 50% is again abnormal so i've just summed it up thank you for bearing with me for my bad network um yeah so i've summed up almost everything in shoulder yes if any questions can take it sir okay uh, thank you dr ayappan uh, we will take question at the end now the second okay. speaker is dr samdi datta uh, he will speak on mri shoulder orthopedic perspective He is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Apex Children Hospital, Calcutta. In Narayan Hospital, Calcutta, he is ex-assistant professor of general medical education services. He is an academic secretary, cast convener, AOTS, deputy member of West Bengal Orthopedic Association, and a total member of West Bengal Orthopedic Association. He is general secretary for Virtual Bitcoin 2020. Uh, Doctor Sundi Datta. Yes, sir. My screen is visible. Uh, yeah you are visible yes you are visible okay uh, thank you uh, up orthopedics association and varanasi ortho club and dr ashutosh for giving me this opportunity so i will uh, uh, talk on this shoulder mri so my talk includes how does the normal mri look like what are the instability scenario in mri and i will talk some show some picture about the calf pathology so Uh, as you know the shoulder joint doesn't um, in, in the normal uh, coronal plane it is 30 degree anterior so the three cuts we take is the coronal oblique sagittal oblique and the axial we see the t1 and t2 images and the specially fat sub images are very helpful to diagnose the tendon and the um, ligament pathology which are often diagnosed in shoulder so there are some softwares also so if you are uh, been able to see get a cd from your diagnostic setup so these software are helpful to measure the actual pathological area so these things may helpful if you can try this so i am coming to the these views first from the axial view if you coming from the top to the bottom you can see the acromion first your supraspinatus muscle belly is full and then you come further down you can see the supraspinatus inserting into the humeral head you can see the spine of the scapula and then further you can start seeing the biceps anteriorly and the infraspinatus posteriorly along with your supraspinatus muscle and then you start seeing the superior glenohumeral ligament biceps and infraspinatus along with the humeral head and can see the only the tendinous portion of the supraspinatus and this cut you start seeing your labrum along with your biceps and the subscapularis anteriorly these cuts are very important for instability scenario because you can see the labrum both anteriorly and the posteriorly and further down you can see the labrum also so next is the coronal oblique or coronal plane if you are coming see the screen on screen image so if you are going from front to the back so you can see your clavicle and coracoid in front in a good quality especially three tesla mri you can delineate your coraco acromion ligament or coraco humeral uh, uh, ligament and and 
this is you can see your coracoid and start seeing your uh, subscapularis muscle and now you can start seeing your supraspinatus as a whole you can see your supraspinatus like a bird uh, big hold the muscle belly then the tendinous portion insert it into the greater tuberosity and you can see the axillary recess down and further deep you can start seeing your infraspinatus tendon as you know your supra and infra inserted as a whole uh, in a tendinous portion in your greater tuberosity and further uh, deep you can see your heel sacs if it is there and you can see the infraspinatus and the teres minor posteriorly and then the comes the sagittal cuts in the sagittal cut when you going from the deep uh, to the uh, um, superficial this is the cut where you can is very important to access the muscle wasting this is um, uh, between the spine of the scapula and the coracoid you can see the supraspinatus muscle is occupying so there if it is being wasted you can measure it and then posteriorly you can see the, your infraspinatus muscle belly and anteriorly you can see your subscap muscle belly and further you can start seeing your humeral head and your more muscular uh, structures are replaced by your tendinous structures start seeing the subscap tendon middle glenohumerus and some part of the infraspinatus and then your muscle belly is almost gone you can see the whole the tendons are inserted along the humeral head your infraspinatus posteriorly you are seeing biceps anteriorly supraspinatus posterior superiorly and you can see the rotator interval also root quality mri can show your inferior glenohumeral ligament and this is where you can see the whole of your tendon belly, belly from front biceps supra infra and you can sometimes delineate or teres minor posteriorly so coming to the instability scenario what do we see in a instability scenario we mainly see the three more component uh, this is your capsulolabrum capsule labrum we call it a capsulolabral complex and the bony pathology these things will guide us to our soft tissue procedure will be sufficient or we need a bony procedure so we measure uh, like a circle the radiologist used to report and we orthopedician arthroscopist used to tell the tear is from 3 to 5 or 1 to 5 or 6 o'clock or posteriorly from 9 o'clock to 12 uh, 6 o'clock so we measure uh, there's like a clock the um, the glenoid um, labrum so how does the labrum look? This is an axial cut. I have shown it before. It's like a jet black structure. It's a triangular cross section. This is your anterior part and then the posterior part. Sometimes we are confused which one is the anterior, which one is the posterior. As we uh, always see our biceps as a um, <clears throat> lighthouse in our arthroscopy. Same thing in an MRI. We see our biceps. So this is our biceps tendon. Uh, uh, so this is your anterior and the posterior. So what happened to the anterior instability? So anterior instability, the humeral load goes anteriorly. So it damages the anterior inferior labrum and some uh, during repetitive action, this anterior hum inferior bony part is damaged. And same when it is relocating, the posterior part of the humeral head also get uh, injured. So there is both bone loss from the humeral part and on the glenoid part. So this is a classical example of a Bankart lesion. See there is same thing as a meniscus lesion. See the posterior labrum is intact. There is a fluid in between the anterior labrum. So that means the labrum is uh, torn. So there is a classical Bankart lesion. Not only this axial cut but your sagittal cut will help to see the delineate how long is the tear. So see the tear, tear is almost from the two o'clock or three o'clock to the six o'clock. So you need a good amount of three anchors to hold this labrum uh, complex in back in position to get your uh, stability back to the shoulder. And there are some, not on, always this uh, soft tissue injury occur, there are some always bony uh, bank cut occurs there is a flake of bone, there's a large fragment of bone is peeled off from the anterior inferior labrum. So sometimes this scenario, your uh, anchor placement is not sufficient. You may need a 
bony fixation in the form of screws also. So there are some variation of the lesion. There is a partial lesion. It's a periosteal avulsion kind of things. You can see this posterior labrum again intact. This is your biceps and your subscapularis. And you have a periosteal kind of lesion. This is a, also an instability scenario and it's a, causing an anterior, anterior instability to the shoulder. There is another variant that is called ulcer anterolateral <clears throat> periosteal sleeve avulsion. This is the ulcer lesion is going in front. So this is an, another example of an ulcer lesion. There are also heel sex lesion is very important to the this instability scenario. What happened to the heel sex? There is a bony defect. You can see the bony defect. It is a very small heel sex here in the hum humeral head but there is a very large defect in the heel sex in the humeral head. So it may be need to be addressed. So sometimes you have to be very careful. If you go further down, there may be a small dent in the humeral head. You sometimes mistake this as a heel sex, but heel sex is on the superior part of the, or the middle part of the humeral head, not you have to go very much down. So there is posterior instability, there is, uh, Though it is very rare, but as Dr. Ayappan said, we previously we used to miss a lot of posterior instability. This is a just, just like a reverse heel sex. It's not an anterior inferior, it's a posterior inst uh, inferior instability. And posterior dislocation is, though very uncommon, but sometimes posterior dislocation is very tricky to diagnose. Same thing, you can see the anterior labrum is intact, but it's a, there is a tear in the posterior labrum that indicates there is a posterior instability. And in a chronic posterior dislocator or a posterior instability doesn't often come to a classical anterior instability syndrome. These patients MRI should be read very carefully because like this picture, you can see there is a leaping kind of thing. There is a kind of adaptive osteophyte kind of formation in the posterior part of the glenoid. So this picture shows there is a, some kind of posterior instability and the adaptive changes happened in this patient. So this patient is probably a sufferer of a posterior instability. And the next thing is a bone loss. Though we know the CT scan is the gold standard to diagnose the bone loss, but we can assume about the bone loss from our MRI finding. We can use the Barkard best fit uh, circle method. As you can see, this is like a pear or avocado shepherd is a classic uh, <clears throat> glenoid, but if it is, becomes a straight line, that means there is a significant amount of bone loss has been happened. So we can measure it, we can uh, detect and that how much is the bone loss, we can, that will guide our soft tissue procedure will be sufficient or not, we may need a bony procedure also for that. But the bone loss, not only we have to measure in the, in the humeral uh, glenoid side, you have to measure the bone loss from the humeral head side. So you have to be, because the, the concept of unipolar bone loss is replaced by the recent times by the bipolar bone loss. So next come to the calf tear. So regarding the calf tear, we have need to do some checklist. So first thing is that we have to diagnose that which tendon or a tendon, not only a single tendon sometimes tear, there may be a supraspinatus along with the subscap tear. So we have to first, diagnose this. Then now, the, which part of the tendon is being torn? First is the enthesis, that is the where the, it is attached to the bone, that part is torn, or is the critical part is torn, or it's a myotendinous junction. Then you have to measure the diagnosis, of, um, measure the tear. In place of supraspinatus or infraspinatus, we need an AP dimension and cephalocaudal dimension for subscapularis. And the retraction of the tendon is also have to diagnose because as much the tendon is retracted, our repair will be very will be going to be tough. Then the muscle atrophy, uh, the fatty infiltration should be noted, and the associated biceps tendon or calf arthropathy should be diagnosed before going to the surgery. <clears throat> so the parts of the tendon, like this supraspinatus tendon, this is the whole muscle belly of the supraspinatus. This is called the critical zone where there is less avascular. There are some doubt, but this is a more or less called the critical zone, that is the footprint of the uh, tendon. So what happens to the tendon? So that the, because the normally there is fluid in between that is very closely packed, they cannot move. So this normal tendon will look like a jet black color. So there is uh, uh, 
it is like a normal tendon but there is a if there is a tendinosis that means some kind of uh, flu, uh, degeneration happened in the tendon so fluid is somewhere moving but not as much the subacromial fluid see there is a changes in, uh, in the tendon's uh, texture but this whiteness of the tendon is not much as white as the subacromial fluid so this is a kind of tendinosis this is not a tear but if you go to this third one where there is tendon is almost torn from this attachment there is this tendon this you can see the clear fluid in between the tendon and its attachment so it's a complete tear it's not a tendinosis so next <clears throat> there are different types of tendinosis partial tear are coming to that so this is a tendinosis we can grade this mild moderate severe regarding the fluid changes so how much is the changes see there is some amount is changes more the tendon is almost the whole tendon is being uh, degenerated so there is not only degeneration sometimes we can see the cystic changes in between the tendon supraspinata substa yes and there is cystic changes also in the bone this also be should be noted the, there is a small cyst but sometimes this kind of large cyst can be available this cyst should be noted because then this patient putting a bony anchor in the gt will be a day zero failure there is a uh, two types of partial articular tears so there is a called a pasta pasta is nothing but an articular surface tear where the the subacromian part is intact but the articular part is torn see the fluid uh, same fluid like here in the subacromian part and in the in the insertion and antipasta is reverse where the basal side is torn this is a classic example of an antipasta tear next you can see the some kind of interstitial tear these tears are very difficult to diagnose by, in arthroscopy so the uh, from outside from the um, shoulder joint or the subacromial part you can see the tendon intact but there is a internal laminar changes within the tendon so there is a, this is an another example of an rim rent tear which is a small anterior anterior part of the tear of the supraspinatus close to this is our biceps tendon is very close to the uh, biceps tendon tear this rim rent tear sometimes may progress to a large supraspinatus tear and this is an example of a full thickness tear see this, there is a clear fluid in between so the tear is in full thickness not only this cut we need a sagittal uh, cut to see the dimension see this difference in two these tears so there is from red to red this is the dimension but this is a large tear probably involving whole the supra and the infraspinatus so our planning of surgery will be different in these two cases so next coming to the subscapularis tear subscapularis tears are very often being associated with an biceps injury because uh, uh, so we are biceps we can see this is subscapularis and this is a biceps this is an example of a biceps uh, being torn and this biceps group is empty but also there is a subscapularis tear so this tear may be uh, on the interstitial part or it is a delamination tear as a whole so another thing as i mentioned is the level of the retraction see the difference in the level of the retraction which is on the humeral head the supraspinatus tendon this is at the level of the glenoid and this is going further down so stays this third picture is a very difficult repair you have need a very expertise because and you will not get a good quality of tendon to attest this to the dgt you should be prepared for that before going to surgery another thing is your guthelier classification as i mentioned before this is the position of the supraspinatus here infra posteriorly and the subscap anteriorly so you can see there is almost all this fascia is been covered by the muscle so there is no wasting it's a grade zero it's a good tendon quality your tendon repair will be uh, very good if you do its repair there is a some streak of fat so in this case your tendon repair will be also be good but there is grade two where the, there is a almost 50 50 but still your muscle mass is more than your fat mass 
so you can cry also but grade 3 where there is a fat and muscle is becoming equal or more but grade 4 is almost no muscle whole is the fat so this grade 3 and grade 4 are very poor prognostic for the repair so <clears throat> thank you once again i take this opportunity to invite you all to the, our first shark iscon it's a physical conference i invite all of you to come to kolkata and have a great time this month 25th to 27th we have live surgery workshop and everything i invite you all to kolkata for that thank you thank you very much thank you dr sandeep thank you dr datta that was a very exhaustive and informative session we had 54 eyes glued to the screen very good now the third speaker is dr amit kumar jha he is a Concerned orthopedic and sport medicine surgeon in Apex Hospital Varanasi. He is in fellowship in sports medicine from Ganga Hospital and Medical Center Committee. And he is a co author for two chapters in books, Technique in ACL Surgery, published by GP Publication, to editor in chief is Dr. Sachin Tabaski, sir. Uh, first is all inside ACL reconstruction, and second is adjustable loop suspension fixation device. Now I request Dr. Amit to start his rendition about basic shoulder orthoscopy. Uh, thank you, Asutos, sir, and uh, UP Orthopedic Association and Varanasi Orthopedic Association for giving me the opportunity. Is my slide visible? Yes. So I am going to talk on basic solar arthroscopy. So after a proper examination and uh, good radiological discussion, we uh, plan the patient to take into the OT. So as the day increases, the indication of solar arthroscopy is increasing. And the reason behind it is it's a less traumatic. Uh, we better able to visualize the intraarticular pathology and deal it in a better way. Uh, less post-operative pain. And for that reason, uh, more and more solar arthroscopy surgery is gaining over the operative. So these are the few indications like instability, cuff tear, biceps pathology, slap tear, adhesive capsulitis, mm -hmm. and so on. What we learned from our master is that visualization is the key to shoulder surgery. These are the four basic principles, understanding and recognizing the pathology, creating a stable construct, and proper post-op rehabilitation. This gives a good result. However, complication rate is still uh, around 4 to 10 percent in shoulder arthroscopy, and neurological injury is the most common finding. And this injury not happen only during portal placement, but also due to vaccination. So we have to be oriented during performing solar arthroscopy, both in the posterior and from the anterior side. When we go, we have to know exactly where the nerves are because suprascapular nerve. Uh, axillary nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, and even the brachial plexus. These are the common nerves which get injured during the surgery. So we have to be always lateral to the coracoid to get in trouble. So these are the two positions which we do uh, solar arthroscopy. One is the lateral decubitus, and second is the beach chair position. Almost all pathology can be dealt with each position. However, the surgeon preference, surgeon uh, training, uh, help, and all, and both techniques having some merit and demerit. So lateral position, there is an increase, uh, it increases the space in the subacromial and glenohumeral joint. Quartery bubbles moves to the subdeltoid space. So working in the subacromial space becomes easy. And there is less chance of uh, uh, hypoperfusion to the cerebrum. While in beach here, it's an anatomic position, examination under anesthesia, arm control is easy. And uh, no need to reposition while converting a arthroscopy surgery to open surgery. However, the, some disadvantage of lateral position is there is an increased chance of neurovascular injury and we have to reposition and re drip again if we have to convert into the open. While in beach chair, there is increased risk of cardiovascular and uh, neural hypoperfusion. Pottery bubbles always comes into the view because of it goes up and it uh, demands in the subacromial space. So uh, it obscured the vision and uh, there is theoretically increased risk of air embolism in beach chair position. So my preferred position is lateral uh, position. And before going into the OT, I make sure all the instrument, all sort of cannulas and the suture passing device, suture retriever is there. And shoulder pump is the must. And we use RF quadri 
and these two are good for the uh, maintaining the view so how i position my patient because positioning is important uh, to prevent the neurological injury in lateral position so our head should not be too down so the it's not we should too high to get obscured during performance axillary padding should be done similarly peroneal nerve protect the peroneal nerve padding should be done traction should be in such a way that it doesn't cause the much injury so while performing we take the patient to the lateral side of the table so that we don't have to lean forward and work and there should be enough space uh, around the head so that we can easily work from the anterior and the posterior portal while working we can move around and the height of the table is such adjusted that you don't have to flex your elbow too much or you don't have to extend your elbows too much because sometimes the surgery become lengthy and it becomes exhaustive so after uh, prepping and draping we do the surface marking portal location is marked and we modify the portal according to the pathology and location of the pathology uh, this uh, this picture is taken from the paxton article usually in all cases we don't need that much of uh, portal so basically we start surface marking with the scapula spine and after marking the anterolateral posterolateral lays of the acromion we move anteriorly mark the anterolateral lays we mark the ac joint by the indirect palpation method either by soft spot or if a lean and thin patient is there we can direct get palpation over the ac joint we mark the clavicle and coracoid and coracoacromial ligament then after marking we mark the basic 5 6 portal placement because after irrigation it becomes so swelled up that uh, recognizing the bony landmark become difficult so the main portal is the, is the posterior portal which is around 2 cm down and 1 cm medial to the posterolateral corner of the acromion accessory posterior portal is used seldom for the posterior lateral work that is around 1 cm down and lateral to the posterior portal posterolateral portal is around 3 to 4 cm lateral and down to the lateral margin of the acromion and in slab repair sometimes we need portal of wilmington that is 1 1 cm uh, anterior and lateral to the posterolateral corner this is the bursal orientation line and uh, lateral portal is just anterior to the bursal orientation line around 4 to 5 cm lateral anterior portal is midway between the coracoid and the anterolateral margin of the acromion and antero superior portal is just anterior to the anterolateral margin of the acromion so after surface marking and Uh, portal placement we start the surgery so while entering uh, into the posterior portal is the main step uh, going inside the shoulder uh, so we have to fill the coracoid with one hand we have to stabilize the shoulder and as we we should only cut the skin not try to cut the muscle or a capsule otherwise it is bleed like a hell so when we go inside it hit the humeral head we have to come little bit medially so that we get the step of the glenoid and then we go in the direction of the coracoid right while entering in the subacromial space just we have to come out we have to touch the acromion and we have to change the angle so that we go into the subacromial space so posterior lateral portal is both for the lateral work of the posterior labrum and also for top pathology uh, portal of wilmington we use in a slab repair especially those slab where the uh, extension is to the posterior labrum where it goes through the supraspinatus tendon so we should not place any cannula while performing this uh, portal of wilmington and it gives a good uh, entry for the anchor which is around 40 to 45 degree to the posterior part of the slab repair nevesia portal seldom use uh, because uh, there is high risk of suprascapular nerve injury while making the anterior portal when we go inside the from the posterior portal we see in front of us the triangular uh, space the rotator interval and through that through that uh, triangular space we have to go inside and that may cover the anterior portal and then we place the cannula in it anterior superior portal is also made in the rotator interval but just lateral to the margin of the cuff and while placing the cannula we should place either uh, lateral or medial to the biceps tendon depending upon the size of the shoulder sometimes it is a small size shoulder then we have to come laterally sometimes it's a large then we go on the, the on the other side in the rotator interval space 
lateral portal is an lateral portal is the work, uh, working portal for the cuff and uh, it is just anterior to the bursal orientation line so how to create a portal so portal creation first we have to visualize through one portal where we want to go we we insert our needle first then the with 11 number blade we go inside then we pass the switching stick or wisinger rod and over that wisinger rod by the twisting movement we insert the cannula so so to improve visualization uh, hypotensive anesthesia is must use of pump device use of rf as needed and decreasing the fluid turbulence while uh, working through the multiple portal we have to uh, stop the egress of the fluid so that the field becomes clear and we can work in a proper way so it's a diagnostic arthroscopy we, when we go inside the uh, through the posterior portal we have to first perform the diagnostic arthroscopy so we uh, view the subscapularis biceps tendon and the biceps pulley then we go up and see the attachment of the cuff here the cuff is torn then we go to see the attachment of the infraspinatus here is the bare area of the shoulder we go in the axillary pouch coming entirely again while sometimes in axillary pouch uh, we can find the pulsation of the axillary artery also this complete the uh, diagnostic round from the posterior portal similarly we have to uh view from the anterior portal to look for the subscapularis subscapulary recess posterior labrum when we go inside we should not uh, get confused with the normal anatomic variation uh, and which is more, mostly common with the anterior superior labral and uh, the biceps anchor sometimes normal clefts uh, we get confused with the slap tear sometimes the bifid biceps uh, which looks like a tear so we have to know from the beginning that and from the our clinical and uh, examination that what we are going to uh, get inside because sometimes the anterior superior labrum is absent and called like mchl which is a buford complex looks like this sometimes sublabral foramen uh, is looks like the tear of the uh, anterior labrum so here i am showing the basic step of uh, the commonly done instability surgery so when from the posterior portal there is a large hill sex lesion i have already made the portals and we are visualizing the anterior labrum is deficient and it's down so these these are my two portals one is anterior superior portal and now i am making the posterior portal uh, and through the posterior portal the hill sex lesion is debrided so that we get a good bleeding bone for the better healing of the infraspinatus tendon over the templis as uh, hill sex area usually i prefer only one anchor but sometimes if the lesion is very large we have to go for two anchor just detecting the cannula out so that it just come out of the capsule but not out of the muscles we take multiple bite through the infraspinatus tendon with the birdwick like instrument and as we see as we pull it the infraspinatus get well adapted to the uh, hill sex area so we don't tie a knot initially and uh, then we go entirely and visualizing from the anterior superior portal we see the panoramic view of the glenoid and we see the anterior labrum is uh, detached and it is down so first step is the liberation during this sometimes there is lot of bleeding so we have to be ready with the rf like device to get control of the bleeding and we have to liberate till 6 o'clock position and we have to check whether we are able to reduce the labrum to the glenoid neck then we position our first anchor at the 5 o'clock position and while taking bite from the labral tissue we should take with capsule labral complex not through the capsule only and knotting to be done on the capsular side not over the glenoid side so uh, thread management and knotting the which is the post limb uh, is necessary but every time entering inside the joint is not so easy sometimes uh, in the case like adhesive capsulitis it is too tight so we have to be very careful to go inside because it can damage the cartilage and after entering the uh, through the rotatory interval we should not insert any, any cannula so that we damage the cartilage and with the rf like device slowly we have to 
release the anterior capsule in front of the uh, starting from the subescapularis margin. We have to clear the rotator interval without damaging the subescapularis and uh, and we should not try to get medial to the coracoid. So this is the view after releasing. So working in the subacromial space, first thing in lateral position is we, we have to decrease the angle from the around 40, 45 degree to 20 degree. And while working in the subacromial space, we have to get oriented such a way that the abdomen is facing up, cuff is facing down. And by the sweeping movement of the RF-like device, which releases the adhesion between the cuff tissue and the surrounding structure. As soon as we get the bleeding, we should stop immediately. Otherwise, it will fill with blood and vision will become hampered. While performing the subacromial decompression, in some cases where we have to do, we have to skeletonize the acromion first and with the burr from anterior to coming posteriorly, we have to decompress it. After decompression, we have to check uh, for the uh, space available in the subacromial and by rotating the arm, we have to look for whether there is impingement is there or not. While repairing cuff, we have to change the, our portal frequently. And when we view from the posterior portal, we will not be able to uh, get the clear picture of the, so we made the posterior lateral portal and then the whole cuff is uh, visualizing well. Then we have to look for the, uh, whether it is reducing well to the footprint or not. If it is not reducing well, if it is very tight, we have to release slowly and we have to keep our patience because sometimes we have to reduce from the glenoid cell also. If we are not able to get, we can medialize our cuff repair not more than 5 to 6 mm. And then again, we have to re recheck. And then we have to place the anchor and we have to take the break. While uh, uh, doing the cuff surgery, we always should look for whether is there any lamination or not. Because sometimes the cuff tear is laminated and we have to look for those lamination. Because taking bite, we have to take the both uh, lamina so that it heals well and gives the good strength. Otherwise, chances of re tear is very high. I'm not going into the detail of anchor and different knotting technique. Uh, but every surgeon, uh, every arthroscopy surgeon should not uh, know at least one sliding knot technique. So success of the solar arthroscopy surgery uh, is the team effort. We need a good anesthetist, good assistant, which hold the cannula proper. Otherwise, sometimes cannula coming out regularly while going inside with some instrument and coming out. So proper portal placement, adjust, adjustment of the portal place as per the pathology, systematically viewing all interest articular structure, anchor and thread proper management and proper post-op rehabilitation gives the good outcome. Thank you all. And I invite you all for the uh, academic meet, which is going to be held on 16th and 7th, 17th April in Apex Hospital, Varanasi. I invite you all for this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Amit. That was a wonderful deliberation on the techniques of uh, uh, shoulder arthroscopy. Uh, now, may we invite the faculty, Dr. Arun Gupta, Dr. Arunim Swaroop, and Dr. Arvind Gupta to uh, lead the question answer session and to take up a few uh, interesting questions. Dr. Arun Gupta. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Arvind, Dr. Uh, Arun Gupta, you're also there, sir. Yes, sir. Can we take up a few questions? Dr. Raji, Dr. Raji Raman, you are there? Yeah, he had. To, he was there. Dr. Raji, he has a different meeting of uh, arthroscopy in a striker meeting, so I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Dr. Arvind, Dr. Arun, Arviyam. Since there are no direct questions, can we have a few tips from the faculty in very short? Dr. Arvind. Dr. Yeah. Arvind. So uh, I'll start with the last talk. Uh, nice presentation, Dr. Amit. Thank you. Sir. Uh, you said uh, uh, pump is must in all the orthoscopy cases. So one is uh, surgery for the uh, instability, another surgery is for cuff. 
so most of the time when you are working for the instability particularly like bancart and uh, slap and all these so you can escape uh, the pump in that case because you have containment of fluid inside the joint so in such type of cases usually you don't require pump all the time and particularly those who are beginner i'll advise go without pump because many a time when there is difficulty in vision maybe because of your high blood pressure and all this a single lot uh, some drops of blood inside the joint and they start pumping the pump and after some time you lost all the landmark here on the shoulder so sometimes it's become very difficult when you are working in with pump with very high pressure true sir so try with uh, instability surgery particularly without pump and for cuff always ask your anesthetics to be your bp at least your systolic should not be more than 90 and you should have your uh, rf or cautery nowadays nowadays a uh, lot of company are coming with cautery that can get inserted with your simple uh, console of your cautery also so no need to another high frequency radio frequency and this all the fancy uh, uh, cautery instrumentation simple uh, basic cautery console and this uh, underwater cautery from arthrex and other company that can work with that also so cautery is must for rotator cuff definitely a point taken sir uh, dr datta i think you would like to add no no same thing i, I personally never use uh, uh, pump because pump create lot of problems and the main thing is your anesthetics take him to get the bp down because otherwise visualization will be a problem another thing i must add during the rotator cuff surgery so you must uh, know to how to convert your also do how to do mini open rotator cuff repair and that's the basic thing when you start learning because all the time we not able to do arthroscopically especially your cuff repairs especially use a beginner like me, me sometimes not able to do all the cuffs um, arthroscopically so giving a mini incision and reducing your cuff nice is a very good option rather than going to a, a flimsy repair that repair is not good i think that's message should be go to the all the uh, person especially who are starting uh, shoulder arthroscopy because cuff repair is not a uh, is always a challenging and every cuff is different not the same dr ayap and please sir um, i agree that um, uh, for instability you can manage without so instability we can manage without a pump um but in my case okay so i do a um, visualized submit i tie the knot subacromially for the remplissage so because so whenever we i feel a whenever in the rotator cuff uh, doing a rotator cuff coming to subacromial space ideally to have the pump and um, we can keep the pump pressure slightly low and we we should be able to manage in uh, so i always used to do instability without a pump for a long time i then had one particular case what happened was no reason we don't know it started bleeding the bleeding was not getting under control so somehow i managed but i regularly use pump but to sum it up instability you can manage without pump yes dr arun any pearls of wisdom yeah. <laughs> uh, to to dr appan that uh, very nice presentation regarding examination of the shoulder uh, to the beginners or newcomers as uh, for any orthopedic examination we should be watchful about patient as the patient to walks into our office Uh, and that has been taught to us his gait so in shoulder gait is uh, immaterial but looking at the age of the patient there are certain diagnostic windows to the patient as far as the chronology of age is concerned so a patient less than 25 years uh, we should look for more signs of instability or he must be coming with the problems of instability whether interior or posterior a middle aged patient um, uh, should be coming with the more signs of ac joint arthritis or impingement and then an elderly patient will come with the uh, problems of a rotator cuff or uh, uh, glenohumeral joint arthritis uh, per se or because of the rotator cuff problems so this uh, small point i wanted to add for the sake of audience uh, 
my preference Can I for ask one question? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, sorry, no. sorry, sir. Yes. Uh, if if suppose there is a patient has come with a, some CT fracture, fresh fracture he is having, we often go for the X X ray and we see there is a minimal injury and just we go for the conservative treatment or by some screw fixation by wires. In these uh, mild cases, should we go for MRI or should take care of other uh, rotator cuff injury or uh, this small injury? I think there is no harm to the cancer. So I think yeah, there is yeah. no so harm. Go ahead, doctor. Go, no harm is doing an MRI if you find a GT fracture there. Because uh, it may be a tear also. There is a tear in the subscap also. And it may be a, some kind of already damaged uh, cuff there. So I think uh, there is no harm in doing a MR there. Because you can prognosticate the patient. If it is an undisplaced fracture, if this cuff is OK, so your conservative approach will be patient will be very fine. That is, cuff is poor, GT is uh, fractured. Then your prognosis, your uh, rehab protocol, and everything you should be able to explain the patient that uh, you will not do well with your conservative approach. So I think there is how no many problem. how many how many weeks we should uh, take for the conservative treatment? Three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. How, how many exact the patient should go for any? Minimally displaced fracture of this. I think doing immobilization with the arm pouch is then start mobilizing. Uh, I think is enough. There is a st standard guideline about the angulation and the displacement of the GT to conserve or to operate. Uh, so I think uh, it's very. Uh, uh, I think we can follow that. I think more than two weeks immobilization, two to three weeks. Some with is free. I think then start mobilize. Doctor, I have your opinion. Yes, sir. Uh, so, so uh, the question was like, uh, should is an MRI required? Uh, definitely, I think MRI is very much welcome because tomorrow we don't want to miss a particular pathology or an injury we don't want to miss. So definitely, um, an MRI is welcome. The indication for surgery in the GT would be more than five millimeter displacement. So that is a classic. So then, um, uh, for me, uh, what I do is, uh, so if it is depending upon the size of the chunk. If it is like a small fragment, then I do an arthroscopic fixation uh, of, with the suture anchors. If it is a bigger one, then I would uh, put a screw in. Um, um, so, and the time of immobilization, definitely, see, um, because the fractures become sticky by four weeks and fracture heals by six weeks. So, at least four weeks I would immobilize and then we would start a passive range after the fourth week if it is still stable with, uh, uh, you know, repeated x-rays. Exactly. That was a point to be noted because the most of the time it deferred the uh, immobilization time. I think it is average four weeks, what others say. Yeah. Dr. Arun. What is my approach? My approach is uh, to immobilize in simple arm pouch for four weeks and then start exactly. gradual mobilization. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is the consensus on this last question. There was one more question in the chat box. Uh, somebody has come up with a uh, 63 diabetic female with recurrent dislocation, MRI cuff tear, bony bank cart, along with a big L sacs. What is your opinion of experts? Let us take this as the last question. Uh, anyone would like to answer that? I think recurrent dislocation. So, uh, uh, should I? Uh, first, in a 63, I think uh, uh, tear, it should be a subscap tear because of the subscap injury. Uh, uh, it is being uh, dislocated and there uh, I think uh, what we will missing about the calf arthropathy there is there is uh, arthropathy is already set in and uh, what I have talked in my lecture the what is the condition of the calf it's there is a fatty degeneration of the calf or already there so that uh, uh, 
Uh, so it's a SSPTR and uh, uh, no arthropathy. I think if it is calf is good, then you have to go for a, a calf repair. I think heel sacs in a 63 years will not causing a uh, problem. I think it's a, my primary approach will be a substep repair along with the supraspinatus there, bicep stenotomy. In a 63, I think bicep stenotomy or tenodesis may do. I think that's my approach. And, uh, and okay, what I will think... do for a recurrent dislocation? I think this location is because of the subscap tear, because of not of the of the capsulolabral complex. And the, I think in 63 year is uh, cuff uh, tear is causing the dislocation. Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Ashutosh, would we like to conclude? My one question to Dr. Arvin. Yeah, thank you all of you for the uh, for, uh, for the great. Great interest. And I thank Dr. Appen, Dr. Samdeep, Dr. Amit, and Dr. Arun Gupta, Dr. Ryan Saroop, and Dr. Arvind Gupta, and Dr. Karmra Singh for the, uh, to be there. And thank you thank all. You, thank you, VOC. Thank you all. Thank you. We hope we meet physically in Kolkata. All of you. Yes. Okay. Let us rub uh, yes, shoulder sir. to shoulder. Uh, in the, this month in Kolkata. So uh, hopefully we have a great meeting ahead in 25th, 26th, and 27th. It's an IS international meeting of Sark Sports Medcon. So I invite you all to come to Kolkata. For physically. I'm okay. coming. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, okay. everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, sirs. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity. Dr. Appen. Hope we are meeting there in Kolkata. Okay. Definitely, definitely coming there. Thank you okay. so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Ashutosh, sir. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah.